Jack Watson, UI UX designer, illustrator, animator, donut connoisseur, and today we're going to be looking at some pro tips for adding shading and details to your illustrations in Illustrator. We're specifically going to be looking at my process for creating stylized flat shaded look after you've established your flats. So let's take a look. So it's easier to look at an example, I think. So um, some of you will recognize this illustration. I worked on it on my personal stream this past weekend. And since this is a pro tip stream, we're going to skip right past some of the basics on sketching and then creating these flat color fills that I've been talking about. Um, a lot of people get to this point in Illustrator and then they either get stuck either not knowing how to add in shadows or highlights or having a hard time maybe conceptualizing where to add shadows and highlights. Um, and this bench illustration is what it looks like. Um, at the flat stage. So these are just flat color fills that I've added in here with a couple of details um, just for the sake of time. I added some donuts to the box because I knew we weren't going to have time to get them all finished on the stream today. Um, and uh, so this is fine. This is totally fine if this is your style and you want to keep it like this, but I want to add some dimension to take it further without taking away from the style I've already established. So for this, I'm not going to be using gradients or gradient meshes. There's not going to be any soft shading in this. I'm going to layer more fill shapes on top to create the kind of shaded look that I want, this sort of stylized shading. And to give you an example, um, this is the cover uh, art for this stream, this little umbrella illustration. This is a finished file, so this is kind of what we're aiming for um, stylistically. And you can see here that every shadow and highlight is actually a solid color um, Fill. There's no gradient on this, no soft shading. And if I go ahead and hit Command Y to show you the uh, crazy outline view here, you can actually see the like solid um, shapes that make up these shadows here. Um, my illustration, actually, I think maybe I hit edges. No, I think it's just because I'm in command, I'm in outline mode. But every single shadow and highlight in here is going to be a um, either a closed shape or a path. So let me get back out of there so you can uh, take a look at the kind of shading that we're going to be creating today. So back over to our bench, like I said, these are, this is flats, this is not, this doesn't have any shading on it yet. And to get started, I need to kind of conceptualize or brainstorm what the lighting is that I want to create and get under, like start to think about that. And I'm going to walk you through my brainstorming process. So when I'm looking at this, I really have this nice foreground area to play with in perspective, the kind of sidewalk where our um, little pigeons are hanging out, and uh, we got a live chat over on Behance and on YouTube, so be sure to say hi. I see Bree over on YouTube and Alessandra, and everybody's complimenting my illustration. Thank you, but we're going to take it to the next level now, you guys. So um, I want to add some nice cast shadows to the front here, because I think they'll just like look really nice in the style of the illustration that I have, and with the, you know, to fill out the space where we've got the pigeons. So in order to do that, I think I'm going to have my lighting be kind of like either early morning or like evening, something where the sun is coming up, but it's not quite risen all the way and it's sort of like sitting down lower so we can get those nice cast shadows. If you're having a trouble sort of conceptualizing lighting, I would say look at references. There's no, no shame in looking at references to get an idea. Like if you want to search for like a park bench at sunrise to get an idea um, of what this is going to look like. And Clever's joined us. Yes, Clever remembers me working on this on the stream. <laughs> and Clever, I did keep the working layer for you uh, right down here of our original bench. <laughs> um, anyways, so we're going to put our lighting kind of in the scene. You don't have to do this, although it, is, it does kind of work with the style. Like maybe this is kind of like a stylized little sun up here. Um, so just so that it kind of as a reminder, you don't have to do this, but if it helps you kind of remember, um, you know, helps you kind of think about your lighting, go ahead and throw it in there. And with that being said, because of the position of our lighting and everything on the left over here, um, the front of my bench is actually going to be in shadow. So that's kind of like the first thing I'm thinking is like, okay, what are my major shadows and highlights going to be? And I might have a little bit of a highlight up on this top edge of the bench, right where the sun kind of hits. But otherwise, it's facing away from my light source in this case. And again, we're going to have our cast shadows. We've got shadows here, shadows here. And then just along the edge of the bench here, I'm imagining that we're going to get a little bit of um, sunlight. So we're going to have a little bit of a highlight on the edge. So now that I've kind of got a plan laid out inside of my head for how I kind of want to do this, um, I'm going to tackle the how. So there's a couple different ways. I'm going to show you different ways that you can kind of do this. So the first way we're going to go over, and this is the way that I'll use sometimes, although not too often, um, to create like the overall shadows and highlights. So. We're going to use draw inside, so I'm going to copy the back of my bench, and I need to create a compound path. I'm going to use um, 
I used command eight there to make a compound um, path out of my shapes. Let me make sure that I've got, um, I don't think I can turn my, I should have turned on my keyboard shortcuts, but <laughs> anyways, I used command eight, I'll just tell you what they are. And um, so I created a compound shape out of this. And with that compound shape, over here in the tool panel, you can see you've got these three little, there, let's zoom in a little bit, you can see you've got these three little like, you know, they're like icons with different shapes that kind of try to show you what's going on. First one's gonna be normal, second one's gonna be draw behind, and the third one's gonna be draw inside. So I'm gonna hit draw inside, and when I do that, and I zoom on in here, um, you get this little dashed line, and that dashed line is like kind of making a boundary around my selection, showing what I'm actually drawing inside. So now, if I add a color to my, um, a fill color to my shape here, I can go in and I can just draw out shape for my shadow and it doesn't matter that it's falling outside of the uh, bounding box here um, because that compound path is where my shadow is being contained so draw inside is kind of containing that to my shape and I was just asking is that a box of donuts it is absolutely a box of donuts that was a request from our chat this weekend <laughs> Um, I've actually still, I've got uh, my list, my working layer. I do this a lot too. If you guys don't do that, haven't seen me work before, I make like notes um, about things that we want to add. Um, and so I made some little notes over here about the things we needed to add to our scene on my working layer. So there you go. I always, I'm always trying to think of ways to help myself remember because it's hard, you guys. Um, and then I can modify this as well. So if, as I'm inside of this draw inside, um, kind of shape here. I can move this down. I can modify this shape. I could actually draw another shape in here as well if I wanted to and it's going to add it to my selection area. Now there's a couple of, there's some positives to this method and there's um, some negatives. So this basically makes a clipping mask for you um, which is fine. In most cases you're gonna, a clipping mask is fine but there might be some situations like if you're making SVGs or you're making uh, you know certain types of things for print where you might not want to have um, a clipping mask necessarily you want to have just like plain shapes right not something inside of a clipping mask so you can see here if I open it up but you can actually see that it has made a clipping mask for me um, and so you could do this tra the traditional way where you make a clipping mask and then put all of your stuff underneath your clipping mask and then clip it all at once this is just kind of an easier way to add a lot of elements to a shape at once without having to like exit out of this mode. If you were doing all of the shading, like I said, if we were kind of going in here, let's bring the tint down on this and let's add like another shape in here. And I'll bring this back behind. We'll make this a little bit lighter. So you can start to like add in some more shading if you want it to really start to build it up without having to like leave um, the, you know, the shape that you're editing and without having to like reset the clipping mask every time. Um, so, n since we're on the subject and you're seeing me kind of like adjust color, I do want to talk about color for a sec, so I'm going to hop over to my working layer, like I said, that I have kind of over here, and um, I always make a color palette. Um, it's like really integral to my process, um, and I made these kind of colors before I got started, and then I added them to my color palette. Um, you can do that just by like, we'll go over here and we'll just pretend to add one, clicking on a new swatch. And I make sure that these are all um, global uh, colors with this checkbox here so that I can, that's allowing me to adjust the uh, tint slider up at the top like you've been seeing me do with the color um, panel up here. Um, now I do want to kind of, there's a couple things here. So I find this really useful for me personally because it, it lets me get a lot, a nice variety of values down, like see them all together in, and like make sure that my, my design will, one, have good contrast because I've got a nice range of lights and darks to choose from. But two, it also lets me um, keep my illustration uh, cohesive. I get really overwhelmed personally if I have a lot of colors. Like some people can work with a color palette that's like enormous, right? Um, I have a hard time with that. I can't work like that. So I actually just will use this and I'll use this kind of like a paint palette, right? So if we were just kind of, you saw me kind of adjust these tints sometimes I'll adjust the um, transparency, the opacity, and the um, blending mode to mix those colors instead. So let's say we wanted to give this, instead of it's like, instead of having a warm color to it, a warm tone, let's make it cooler. And we can do that by changing our shadow from our dark brown to be this kind of blue. And I'm gonna bring the colors. You can see if I use the tint slider, it's not actually gonna mix those colors. But if we go over here and we adjust the 
uh, opacity slider. Now we're mixing those colors in here. We're mixing the colors with the bench with our shadow color, right? To kind of create those cooler shadows on top of our bench. And it's totally changed the color in our scene. We could also, if we wanted to, we could play with blending modes. Like let's say that we wanted to mix like this orange and it's not dark enough. Um, I would use a dark, a multiplier or a darkening blending mode to darken that color. So I'm still keeping the same color. I'm still keeping a consistent color palette, but I can play with a blending modes and transparency or uh, opacity to expand my color palette a little bit and mix colors together. So that, I think of it as like a painter, a painting palette that you can kind of like mix with transparency um, and blending mode. So, all right, let's go back to our initial color here because I do want to use a warmer color palette. I'm going to bring this below my donut box, um, just over top of my bench layer. And I'm going to show you another way that you can work with um, a similar way to draw inside, but it's actually the way that I prefer to do this. So I'm going to make another compound path here. And um, this time I'm just going to draw my shape over top. So I'm going to add my highlights. So I'm just going to draw a shape over top to create a highlight here. And oh, before I forget, let me Remind me, chat, that I need to tell you one more thing about colors. Um, and I'm going to add this yellow here. So we've already got kind of like a warm... Oh, it looks like I added it to my clipping group. Let's make sure we don't do that. All right, so we've got our color here. I'm going to make sure that it's on top of my compound path so you can see it. We are using this warm color palette. We've got like the the warm shadows on the bench. We're going to have warm lighting from the sun on, our, on, the, on the seat. Um, because... Uh, that's kind of the look and feel that we're going for. And I can go here now. So instead of um, using draw inside, this time I'm going to select my compound path and I'm going to select that shape I made for my um, highlight. And I'm not concerned. You're like, why are you drawing it and having it be all over the place, Jack? Don't worry about it. It's fine. We're going to use uh, Pathfinder this time. And I this is the way that I love to work. When I found out about this, and I actually think I learned this from working on Illustrator on the iPad, um, if you hold down Option or Alt, and with the Shape Builder tool, if you click on these, you'll actually make what's called a compound shape up here. And this lets you work just like you would if you were using Draw Inside, except the added benefit is once you're done and you have everything the way that you want it to look, you can hit Expand and it's going to break that into individual shapes for you. So if you're ever in a situation, if you've ever worked with clipping masks before, and, and shapes and then you're like oh but now I actually want to cut those out I don't actually want them to be inside of clipping masks this is kind of like a way to get the benefit of both worlds where you can have something uh, with that compound shape where I can continue to go in here and I can modify this second highlight shape all that I want and if I wanted to change the like look of it if I wasn't confident in the you know the highlight and then once I'm ready and even if I did the whole illustration this way and I used a lot of compound shapes when I'm done, if you don't want to expand them individually from the Pathfinder window, you can go up to Object, Expand Appearance, and it's going to do the same thing. It's going to expand them all at once and cut them all out, um, which is super, super handy if you want to have an illustration that's just clean shapes at the end. Um, so yeah, there's my tip. That's what I like to work with is actually this method. Now there are a couple of downsides. With everything, there's like, you could do this, you, you can shade illustrations a million ways in Illustrator, right? But there's positives and negatives, and you kind of have to decide what method is going to work the best for your output. In this case, I can't actually copy more shapes into this. So if I try to do the same thing that I did with this up here with Draw Inside, and I try to like add another highlight, it's actually going to just add another shape to my compound shape. So it'll affect the actual shape instead of having like multiple objects inside of a mask, if that makes sense. There is a little bit of a workaround if you keep your compound shape um, active and you don't expand it. So I'm going to actually make some adjustments here. I'll bring the opacity down. We'll get our, our lighting set up. We could also add like a nice screen to this if we wanted to or something like that. I'm just going to leave the color as is. And I'm just going to make a copy of my compound shape. And now I, with that copy, now I can go in here and I can edit my my highlight if I wanted to. We can like go in here and maybe want to add like a little bit of a a second highlight on this where the top of this bench kind of comes up. We can make this lighter. Make sure we've got the right shape here. Make this lighter. Something like that. 
I'm just modifying the shapes inside of here and then once I'm done I can just expand it. Alright, so we've got the major shadows and highlights on our bench. I, we can continue to kind of work. I like to work kind of large to small. Um, it's a good way to establish your overall values. And if you start to focus on the details too soon and things aren't lining up, uh, it, you could have to do some work to kind of bring it back. So it kind of, it just kind of helps you if you work kind of large to small. I would continue to kind of go in here and, and refine um, and maybe add additional shading to my bench. But for now, I want to get that cast shadow in because that's really important um, to my scene. And I think it's going to like help ground our illustration a little bit. So I'm going to copy my um, compound pa path here. Copy and paste in front. I'll just move it down here kind of generally in position, right? Kind of looking at my lighting and saying, where is, where is this going to go? Where is this going to be positioned? Because if you imagine the shadow, the cast shadow is going to be cast from the slats on our bench, right? That's going to be the primary, you know, part of the shadow there. And I'll delete this one in the front because I don't actually need it. All right, and then I will use one of my other favorite tools here, the uh, free transform, and we'll just skew this a little bit. So skew it on over. Skew it on over. All right, move this up a little bit. All right, so this is looking good. And I'm going to move this just so it's not so distracting, covering up my poor little pigeons there. We'll move it behind the bench. Okay, so um, I'm able to kind of like skew and adjust that into place and get my, my shadow for that looking really nice. But um, for the legs, I just like to draw these manually. Um, just kind of follow the shape that I already have. Um, this is kind of like, so the light here and the the shapes for the slats on the bench seat are help are helping me kind of like get there. But when it comes to the legs, it's just the free transform tool does doesn't do it for me. I like to just kind of draw them in myself. There's no really easy way to get them kind of lined up. So I'll go over here and I'll just follow sort of like connect the dots almost. Um, and I'll just kind of like go in and I'm just going to follow these shapes that I already have here. Right. And I'll make the round part. There we go. So there's one leg and then I'll do the same thing kind of over here. We'll start from this leg, go across and they're inset a little bit um, because they are, um, that's where they kind of fall on the bench. If you take a look here. Um, they're kind of inset from the where they connect to the bench. Okay, so there's our bench legs and our um, the main part here. I can also add another shape here, which is like the rectangle tool for like the back part, if I want to, for like the um, the back part of the bench there. There we go. All right, so now we've got our bench kind of like worked out here. Um, there's a couple of ways that we could go about merging these. I could go about using the same um, method that I used with Pathfinder and holding down um, option to merge all these shapes and have them still be editable. If I wasn't confident about the um, shapes that I have here, if I wasn't confident about them, I would do that. Um, you could also use, if you want to have like something with a nice fall off on it, you could use an opacity mask, but since that's not really the style that we're going for, um, in this case, I would probably either just use Pathfinder Unite um, or you could use the shape builder. If you're confident um, with the shapes that you have, you can just go ahead and use like one of these tools. Um, it's just, I, I tend to not use this if I'm not confident. So like I'll use that um, compound shape method. So there we go. There we go. I'm just kind of bringing everything together. All right, so now I've got a single shape here for my bench. And I'm going to move this below. Oh, it was already below. And we'll just change the color of this to our kind of maybe our, our cooler color. Honestly, you could go either way. And I'll just uh, bring this down to lighten it. So there we go. Now we've got our, our bench has a nice cast shadow. Everything is looking pretty good. Fortunately, um, our donut box, if we, um, if we wanted to add that as well, just to kind of like finish off um, the bench area itself. Um, I can just very easily copy. I've got a shape here for the top of the donut box, and obviously the top of the donut box is going to match the bottom. It's going to be the general shape of it. So I can just use that, copying and pasting it, and I'm just going to bring it down and across. So this is just this is easier than the bench. The bench is a little bit more complicated, um, just because we've got to skew that shape. And there you go.
And now we've got a nice, uh, our bench is looking really nice here. I might go in here and do a couple other things, like I said, just before I kind of finish out the major um, parts of this bench, I would add another, just with a rectangle, nothing fancy, add a highlight up here. Just as a reminder for myself, maybe down the line, that I wanna have a, um, a rim light up there that's also gonna have like a little bit of a highlight to it, right? We we'll wanna make sure we put that behind our pigeon's foot. Pigeons gotta have their foot in front, right? Everybody's loving on these pigeons in the chat. They're pretty fun. <laughs> oh, I need a donut, a shadow on the ground for the donut. You're right, you're right. We need to pull this down. And we need to merge this with our shapes. Let me do that real quick. Can't, we gotta have the donut box shadow underneath as well. And then I'll pull this down. Oh, you know what? I think it's merged with my, there we go. Fixed it. There you go, Oliver, just for you. Um, yeah, so I do want to show you one other thing, um, just because I'm, I'm concerned about time. Um, <laughs> and I want to, so I'm going to go into working on some details now. Um, even though I said you should, you know, we should go in here and we should finish out the pigeons and stuff like that. But I really want to show you a couple other techniques while we're here, just so you have all of the, you know, the basics. Oh, and do, you, chat, you let me forget about the colors. Oh, clever, Jack, holding on to the color secrets, yes. Um, I wanted to show you one more benefit to using global swatches. So if you're like, Jack, I don't know how I'm going to know if I'm going to like using my colors or not. Like what if I establish this color palette and then I decide that I hate this brown? Um, it's global swatches. You've applied them all. If I double click in here and I want to change this to be a teal bench, I can go in here and do that. I'm going to switch it to hue, saturation, and brightness. And we can make this bench, we can make it purple, we can make it teal, we can adjust the brightness. We do whatever we want, and it's going to change them all across the whole illustration. Now, obviously, we need to adjust our yellow as well, but there you go. If you wanted to change that color at any time, you can. That's kind of the other benefit to working with global swatches, aside from the ones I already talked about. Okay, I do want to show this to you because it's important. Um, and that is adding um, some additional highlights, like sharper highlights and sharper details, using the width tool. So I've got this donut box and donut boxes usually have like a really high gloss coating on them. And so we want to add a really sharp highlight. Don't be afraid of sharp highlights. I think people are a little bit afraid to add sharp highlights, but don't be afraid. Commit to the sharp highlights. So I'm going to use the offset path here and I'm just going to create a shape that's inside. So we set this back to zero. If we go up, it's going to create a shape that's, you know, six pixels outside in all directions or it's gonna create um, a shape that's like set inside if you go to the negative values. So we've got our shape inset now, perfectly inset inside of here. This would be great if you wanted to add like a decal to this box or something, but we wanna add a highlight. So I'm gonna delete that point and I'm gonna change it to just a stroke. Um, and I'm just gonna, I'm just gonna taper the ends of this. It's super easy. So, um, you know, if you imagine again, following our lighting, there's gonna be a, a sharp highlight that falls here. And we're going to use the width tool, and I'm just going to zoom way in so you can see what I'm doing. And I can drag this way out or way in. So if we drag it out, it's going to make it really wide. If we drag it in, it's going to taper it all the way to the ends. And you're probably thinking, yeah, but I could do that with just the, the stroke width profiles exist. Right, except you can't customize it. And I like to have like a highlight like this across the front really come across the front and be stronger in the front. So I need it to be wider. So I added an additional point in here to kind of be able to customize how far my highlight gro goes across. Um, so yeah, I, I just think that this is better than using this, the regular stroke with profiles because I can customize them. Let me give you a, a better example here on our pigeon since I know everybody's excited to see the pigeons happen before the end of uh, our stream today. So if we have our little pigeon here and let's say that we want to add like a little bit of a highlight onto this real quick. Oh, my mouse is getting stuck. I'm just going to draw uh, a general shape where my highlight would kind of fall on my pigeon. They kind of have like an iridescent front, so this kind of makes sense for, for these birds. So I'm going to switch this to have a round end cap. And let's bring the opacity down a little bit. And then I'm going to go to the width tool. I'm going to just expand this out and bring this down. Actually, let's leave that a little bit wider so you can see. We can start to add a little bit of highlight here as well to like the front of our pigeon. And this is a little, maybe a little bit weird out of context. Like I would probably want to add, build up a little bit more shading <laughs> before we got here, but you know, um, here we go. 
we'll do like a little intersect and then we'll decrease this so it looks a little bit more normal here. There's like a little bit of a harder highlight and then this is softer. But yeah, there we go. So that's how I would go about adding those like more like, I don't know, some more organic kind of like um, highlights using lines or if you wanted to add like sharper highlights uh, like on the donut box here. I would use a, a custom stroke width profile by using the width tool. So um, yeah, unfortunately we're like running out of time. So we're well on our way to having this done though. So, uh, but sadly we're out of time. So. <laughs> Um, thank you for joining me. We went over a lot of stuff today. We went over Draw Inside, Pathfinder, um, we went over Clipping Mask and Compound um, Shapes, specifically Compound Shapes, which are different than Compound Paths, and Creating Cast Shadows, Creating Sharp Highlights, um, all the basics you need to fully render out a scene like this um, using a flat color style. So stay here. Up next, we've got more graphic design live streams on Adobe Live after me. Bye, everyone.